Okay, here we are, uh, Stress Busters, our series uh, entitled Stress Busters. Uh, we're doing lesson uh, number six in this series, and the title of the lesson is Stress from Loss. Stress from Loss, and part one, because I've got a lot to say about this, uh, particular, this particular topic. Uh, I think a lot of us uh, may have attended uh, seminars uh, that deal with grief and loss, and so some of tonight's material uh, may be uh, familiar to uh, many of you. Hopefully it'll be comforting to those who are dealing with loss at this time. And it will also serve as a, a reminder for those people who have dealt with these types of issues uh, in the past. And of course, uh, we're going to be looking tonight, not necessarily at, the, at, at grief, but the stress that comes uh, from the uh, grieving uh, process. So before we start with that, uh, I think we should begin with a, a definition, definition of loss. The title of the, uh, the lesson tonight is uh, a, a Stress from Loss. Uh, what is loss? Well, uh, when discussing loss, we usually think of the loss of a loved one, you know, father, mother, a sibling, some, a spouse, you know, because of all loss, this type of loss generates the most stress and the most pain. But there are other types of losses that we experience that also produce pain and grief and stress in the same way, perhaps to a lesser degree, of course, uh, than, the, than the loss of a loved one. Um, for example, you lose your job. Well, that's a significant loss. You know, you're laid off, especially uh, during these days, uh, COVID, the pandemic and all this business. And all of a sudden uh, your company shuts down or your, your restaurant uh, is forced to close down and you lose your job. Well, it's not the same as obviously the loss of a, of a spouse or a child, but it's still a loss and it still causes a certain amount of grief uh, and stress. The loss of a friend. I don't mean if your friend dies, but I mean you lose a friend for some reason. They move away or you have a, a disagreement that uh, can't, be, uh, you know, uh, can't be settled and somehow uh, a friend who was very close is no longer a friend. Well, that's a loss. The loss of a marriage the loss of a business, the loss of freedom. You know, uh, 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 as you grow older, you are not able uh, to, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to travel around as you used to. Uh, it's a big thing, for example, uh, when the kids have to take the car keys away uh, from grandpa uh, because he's, he's not as good a driver as he used to be. As a matter of fact, he's becoming a dangerous driver to himself and to other people. That, uh, people feel the loss of their ability to drive. Uh, they feel that acutely and, and it causes them uh, pain and stress. The loss of a home, the loss of security, uh, people investing and saving and then all of a sudden the, the market crashes and you lose not just, the, not just the money but the security that that money uh, represented. And then there are other things that are a little more, you know, harder, you know, like intangibles, the loss of self-esteem, you know, your pride, your reputation, uh, the loss of idealism, for example. You start becoming a little more cynical about things. It's harder for you to become excited about an idea or a project, you know, the, that loss of enthusiasm. All of these things and more uh, uh, are losses and, and each one of these losses um, costs us something emotionally and they each in their own way create a certain amount of stress. And so when we lose any one of these or a combination of these, there is of course pain and grief and the stress that comes with these uh, usually experienced through the feelings of uh, despair and loneliness 
uh, bewilderment, anger, anxiety, sadness, fear, guilt, worry, depression, hopelessness, all these feelings accompany various levels of loss and produce various levels of stress. So in dealing with the stress generated by loss, we need to understand first the grieving cycle and then have a strategy to help us find some answers to comfort us um, in our losses. So let's start with grief and loss. We need to understand kind of a, a basic relationship here. Um, loss of any kind produces grief and grief produces stress. There's the basic equation. Any kind of loss produces a certain level, a certain intensity of grief and grief uh, produces stress. When we understand not only this relationship, but also the grieving process itself, then we'll be able to reduce our stress because one factor that causes stress in lost situations is ignorance of what's actually happening to us in the grieving process. We don't understand what's going on in the grieving process. And so uh, that misunderstanding or lack of understanding also creates a certain amount of stress. Now I mentioned a familiar name, Dr. Kubler-Ross, uh, a pioneer in the study of the effect of grief on people. And she uh, said uh, that there are five stages uh, that people go through when they grieve because of a loss of some kind, not just the loss of a person, but the loss of any kind, there's, a, there's grief. And uh, grieving is a process. And that process has, she wrote in her book, uh, five uh, element, five stages, if you wish. The first she described was denial, the feeling of being overwhelmed. You know, the idea, oh dear, this can't be happening or they can't be happening to me. Or, you know, we refuse to believe that uh, whatever has happened has taken place. Uh, the next uh, that she describes is anger. Uh, people are angry at God or angry at themselves or others for the thing uh, that has taken place, for the loss that has taken place. I can relate to this, I remember when my own dad passed away suddenly when I was a young boy, uh, 15 years old. And I remember, you know, walking the streets uh, after his uh, death late at night. And, and I remember kind of shaking my fist at God. I mean, literally looking up at the heavens and saying, why did you do this? Why did you take my father away from me? You know, anger at God. Um, another stage, uh, bargaining. Uh, bargaining is the, if only stage, you know, if only kind of thought, if only I would have been there sooner, if only I would have gone to the doctor to look after him, you know, this, uh, this type of bargaining. If I would have done this, uh, we could have avoided that, you know, dwelling on the past uh, or making promises. People who are terminally ill, for example, they're bargaining with God. If you just let me live till Christmas, you know, I promise I'll do this, you know, uh, the bargaining stage. Another stage, of course, is depression, sadness, the loss of energy, the feeling of hopelessness caused by uh, the pain that um, is produced because of the loss that we have uh, suffered. And then of course, the fifth uh, stage, uh, which is acceptance. Um, and acceptance uh, is um, a submission to the new reality uh, that you're able to deal with the change. You know, you accept the new situation without uh, the loved one or the loss of a job, you know, acceptance is, well, that was a great job and I love that job and I don't think I'll ever find a better job, but now I have this new job and, you know, I'm going to make the best of it. You know, this acceptance stage. Now, I think many of us have, ha have heard of these uh, five stages uh, or experienced them in our own lives. Um, and when we experience loss and the grief that comes with it, uh, of course, there will be stress. 
Uh, now we can reduce that stress when we realize the following things connected with what is going on and what we are going through. For example, uh, we are never quite ready for the pain and the stress caused by grieving over the loss of someone or something. We're never quite ready for that. We think we're going to be ready. We think we're going to be able to handle it, but we're never quite ready for how much it hurts or how quickly it has happened or the confusion that it causes or the, uh, uh, the debilitating factor uh, that, that it, it uh, causes in our life. We're never quite ready for it. You know, it helps lower our stress level if we see grief as a process and not just as a, a singular event. For example, it's not just uh, for the gravesite. You know, some people say, well, we'll grieve at the gravesite. They think that crying at the gravesite or being quiet at the gravesite or saying, well, he's gone and we're just going to have to accept it. They think that's grieving. You know, there's a period and then once the, uh, the funeral director says, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, you know, we, our prayers go out to the family and that's the end of it. They think, oh, the grieving's over. <laughs> but they don't realize that the grieving process, it goes on for months, even years. As some estimates say that the grieving process on average lasts about 18 months. 18 months, a year and a half. Uh, the idea being, you know, you're able to go around the circle of life one time, you know, one Christmas, one Thanksgiving, one birthday, one anniversary, you know what I'm saying? And then around almost the second time before we finally start getting out of the grieving process. Also, we need to realize that it's a cycle as we travel through one emotion after another, sometimes coming back to one stage over and over again. A lot of people in the grieving process uh, have repeated feelings of anger at the spouse who left you know, in a marriage, for example, or uh, the parent who died uh, and they died before we could resolve certain conflicts that we had. Uh, they died before we could tell them uh, certain things that we uh, wanted to, to tell them. And so when it comes to grief, it's better to think long-term rather than short-term. Uh, the hurry you know, to get feeling better uh, causes stress. The people don't realize this, but you know, when people say, oh, come on, you can, you, you can get over it, you know, get over it. It's fine, just pick yourself up and just uh, get going. You, know? you gotta live, you gotta move on with your life. You know? And when people say things like that, I, I'm sure they have the best of intentions. What they're actually trying to do is they're trying to rush people. They're trying to you know, help them to kind of move on uh, through the grieving process. You know? uh, it's been two months since your husband died. You know? You've gotta move on. You can't rush grief. It takes the time that it takes, and it, it's different for different people. So when it comes to grief, as I say, it's better to think long-term rather than short-term. And the worst thing that we can do is to hurry people uh, along. You can't hurry them along. Um, another uh, stress reduction idea when you're going through grief is to realize that grief resolution is necessary uh, for healing, for recovery. In other words, we need to grieve. There's no way to feel better without going through the grieving process. So many people try to avoid the grieving process. They try to suppress it. They try to avoid it, you know? But you know, if you don't grieve now, you're gonna grieve later but sooner or later, you're going to have to go through the process of grieving your loss. Uh, remember also that the grieving is not, a, is not a disease, it's not a sickness. It is the body's natural way of dealing with loss. 
you know, God in His mercy and in His wisdom realized that in our lives, we as weak uh, human beings would experience loss of many kinds. And He has wired us in such a way that we can deal with loss without it destroying us, okay? So uh, for example, uh, uh, denial is like a psychological shock absorber that helps us to withstand the pain that comes with terrible loss. You know, denying it and pushing it back. I mean, we're not in that stage for very long, but at the beginning it's necessary because the reality of the loss may be so overwhelming that it would, you know, it would destroy us. And so denial is like a shock absorber that helps us kind of you know, absorb the loss in stages. <laughs> so it doesn't completely flatten us. And anger is a natural vent for hurt feelings and confusion at the changes that are caused by loss. Uh, we have to learn, of course, how to express that anger. Uh, it's like a event that allows us to release strong feelings uh, without creating damage and hurt. You know, anger all by itself is not wrong. Anger is simply strong emotion. And the uh, occasion of loss in our life, loss of jobs, loss of a loved one, uh, creates strong emotions. And we have to be free to be able to vent those strong emotions. We have to be able to be allowed to be angry uh, so that we can uh, process the very strong and confusing emotions caused uh, by loss. And again, always the idea uh, that processing these things in a, in, a, in a correct way, in a positive way, also lowers the stress caused by these things. Bargaining, bargaining is our way of reaching out to find a solution to the problems that are caused uh, by the loss. And sometimes you know, in the bargaining, we're not being very realistic, but at least it gives us a chance to begin to deal realistically with what is taking place. It's usually the shortest, the shortest stage uh, that we stay in. A depression is the natural reaction to the difficult new reality that loss has brought about. I mean, it's the point where we're allowing ourselves to feel the pain. I mean, how else will you feel if you're experiencing the pain of losing your husband, your wife, your child, how else are you going to express pain uh, but to feel depressed, to feel sad, to feel the loss of joy, to feel slow, to feel you just want to sleep all the time and so on and so forth. Uh, of course you're depressed. It would be unnatural for you to just be happy, pick up where you left off, not a problem, go back to work the next day. That would be unnatural. Depression is the natural reaction to the pain caused by loss. Obviously we can't stay there forever, but the fact that we experience depression is, is normal in a grief situation. And then of course, acceptance. Uh, acceptance is the final balance that we try to find between the old and the new realities in our lives that are caused uh, by, by loss. Uh, you know, the man who loses his arm in an accident, I mean completely, you know, it's severed from his body. I, acceptance for him is, uh, I'm still me, but I am now me, but I only have one arm. 
I'm me with one arm. I used to have two arms, but I've only got one arm now. But I'm still me and I still have a life. There are things I no longer can do that I used to do. And there are things that I'm going to learn how to do now that I only have one arm that I'm going to have to you know, learn how to do with just one arm. But acceptance is accepting the fact that the situation has changed and that you need to accept the reality of the new situation. It's not a better situation, it's a different situation. And you know, unfortunately, it, it might not be as good as the old situation, but you can adjust to it. And that's the whole idea of acceptance. You're adjusting to a new situation. The object of grieving uh, is to recover. You know, a lessening of the intensity and the frequency of the pain and of the sorrow uh, that we naturally feel from loss. At the beginning, the intensity is, is great and the frequency is nonstop. I hurt badly and I hurt badly all the time. And through the grieving process, what happens is, well, I start to hurt less and less and less, and I don't hurt as often. I, I, I'm not sad and, and hurting from you know, eight in the morning till midnight. Now I may be hurting from eight in the morning till 9.30 in the morning, and then I forget about it. And then I have, a pain, a, you know, I have an episode of sadness at three in the afternoon and maybe before I go to bed. And you know what, with time, a whole day goes by and I don't even think about the loss that I had. And as time goes on, you know, the intensity and frequency get less and less and less and less. That's called recovery. Now this doesn't mean total elimination, but it is a gradual decline of the discomfort level. And as the discomfort level goes down, so does the stress level. You know, uh, I'm not going to take off my shirt and my, my sweater here, but when I was a boy, I, I had an accident and I cut my arm. I mean, it was, like, it, it was sliced open like a fish. You know, it was sliced open, lots of blood, so on and so forth. And they had to fix it. And there was a terrible scar that was you know, on my arm. And it hurt. I remember, I still remember, you, know, touch, you couldn't touch it. As time went on, the scar healed. It was still a little sensitive and red. And then after a year or two, only a scar remained and the memory of the accident. And today, of course, uh, some uh, 65, almost 70 years later, the scar is still there. You can still see the scar on the arm, but you know, I can touch it, I can tap it, I can talk about it, I can bend my arm. There's no pain involved at all. Only the memory remains, but there's no pain and there's no stress. I can see the scar, but the scar no longer causes pain, no longer causes stress. And that's how it works with grief and, and processing loss. Eventually the scar is still there. You, 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 you remember it and you see it, but it no longer causes pain. Talking about it no longer creates stress or hurt. And that's what we're striving for. It takes time. You need to work at it. You need other people to help you, but eventually the sun shines again and the scar doesn't hurt anymore. It's still there, but it doesn't cause any pain or stress. With the decrease in pain, as I say, there is also a decrease in stress. Then a third point I want to make about grief and stress reduction and that is, there's not always an answer. There's not always an answer. You know, people's main question when loss occurs is to ask why. They want to make sense of what has taken place. 
you know, a, a happy young wife and mother is suddenly left a widow. Why? Uh, hopes uh, for a bright career are dashed because of someone's careless mistake. Why? Uh, someone who is doing so much good for others is rendered helpless through a crippling disease. Why? Why would, why would God do that? Why would that happen? This questioning is painful and it is also stressful when there's no clear answer uh, that is found. Many people think that the reason for the grieving process is to find the answer to the question why? But this is not so, this is incorrect. One important insight that the process does give us is that God doesn't always provide the answer to the question why, but he always provides what we need in times of crisis. You know, he, uh, he doesn't always provide the answer to the question why, but he always provides what we need. He provides comfort uh, through the Holy Spirit, uh, through the church, through his word. He provides assurance that there are some things that we will probably lose, uh, health, wealth, loved ones, life. But he also assures us that there are some things that we will never lose. Talks about this in Romans chapter eight, verse 35, Paul says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So yes, we may lose many things, but the one thing that God guarantees that we will never lose is his love, which is found in Christ Jesus our savior and our Lord. You know, there was a, a young woman uh, who was uh, in our congregation many, many years ago. Her name was Lisa, Lisa Coffey. And she was 33 years old and she had uh, two, two children and a wonderful husband. And uh, she passed away from cancer. Couldn't, couldn't fight it and it took her life. And her father, Don, told me uh, at his uh, daughter's funeral that he didn't understand how people without faith could go through this horrible ordeal and survive. How many times have we said it ourselves or heard that? How do people without faith, how do they survive such terrible things, especially the loss of, a, of an adult child? You know, the parents uh, we believe that it's supposed to be a rule, you know, we're supposed to go first, not our children. And when our children go on to be with God before us, it's a terrible shock. It's a terrible burden, a terrible loss that creates a lot of pain and certainly a lot of stress to go with that pain. Well, as we spoke, Don and I, we concluded that unbelievers do face terrible tragedies and they do come out of it, but they come out of it uh, resigned or perhaps they're bruised in their spirit or they're bitter. Uh, many of them are frightened or some of them are in per, uh, you know, permanent denial. But one thing that they, they do not have is that they don't ever come through these terrible events, hopeful. Hopeful is not a thing that they aspire to. 
the pain and the suffering are the same for Christians, but what awaits them on the other side of grief is hope. You know, Don was thankful that Lisa's suffering was over and he was hopeful that he would see her again in heaven. And of course, several years later, uh, he himself passed away and uh, his hope uh, is now uh, realized, of course. So that hope is what keeps the spirit up. That hope is what helps us to let go for a while. That hope is what gives us courage to go on uh, with a loving heart and a cheerful attitude and a thankful spirit and an enthusiastic approach to the rest of life and a, a greatly reduced stress level because we have hope. Paul the apostle says that while those who have no hope when they grieve, Christians can look forward to a very specific event in the future that will re reunite them with both their God and their loved ones after death. In 1 Thessalonians chapter four, he says, but we do not want you Christians, he's talking about, to be uninformed brethren about those who are asleep. So that, and here asleep meaning Christians who have died. And then he goes on to say, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these, with these words. Notice what he says, that we will be caught up together with them in the cloud. So we will be with the ones that we love and with the Lord, and we will always be with them. That's the hope, that's the promise. And so, We've learned that stress is caused by the grieving process that necessarily follows the loss of any kind. Overstress, you know, the bad kind of stress, is created when, first of all, uh, we are ignorant of the process and we have no way of understanding and dealing with these natural feelings that come about as a result of loss or we remain too long in this process, refusing to move on from anger or from depression uh, in order to uh, accept the situation uh, that we're in. Now, the world's answer is to understand the grieving process and to get help to go through it in a normal time period. You know, get some counseling, get some medication, join a support group. These this is the best answer that the world has to, has to offer, except what you cannot change. I mean, that's the best answer that acceptance through the grieving process will give you. However, Christ's answer doesn't circumvent the natural grieving process. It goes beyond the stage of acceptance to the stage of hope. Through Jesus Christ, we have the hope of eternal life after death. And so for us, death is only a temporary separation that will be abolished forever when Jesus returns. This is what we look beyond death to in order to lift our spirits and to keep the link with the one before us alive. This is our hope and, and the promise that helps uh, us end our grieving with a, a whole heart rather than with a hole in our heart. See the difference? The people without Christ, they go through the grieving process, but there is always a hole 
in their heart where the one that they lost uh, used to be. For Christians, we have a whole heart because Christ gives us hope and hope gives us a wholeness of heart. So the resurrection of Christ is central to our faith and the promise of our own resurrection in Christ is central to our hope. It, it's what makes the death that surrounds us bearable in this life. Because we look around us and there's nothing but death, right? People die all the time. There's no other end to a life. We, however, we have hope beyond death. And this is what gives us joy. And in a very practical way, it's what, re it's what reduces the stress caused uh, uh, by the grief we feel uh, when we lose. Now I said that this lesson was uh, part one in stress because of loss. There's a second part to this. And in the second part, uh, let's see, yeah. Uh, in the second part, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, uh, advice for those who wanna help those who are grieving to help them reduce their stress level. So today uh, we talked about when these things happen to us, uh, the next time we get together, we're gonna talk about how to help others grieve and how to help others reduce the stress level because of their loss. So I hope that you'll be with us for that next lesson in this series on stress busters. All right, thank you very much for your attention and we'll see you next time.